Thanks for joining us. We are Red and April Off-Grid. For the last year, our son has been working on building his own home. Now that we are done with our house, we are helping him finish his Hyper Adobe Tiny House. In today's video, we'll be showing you the rest of the roof install and a quick look at his new septic. Last week, we started on the stucco and installed the eaves and soffits. Now we are finishing up by painting them to provide some protection, and we will be installing the deck and the roofing metal. We're using a good quality paint here with primer added and putting on two nice coats. Kyle liked blue, so we're painting it blue, and I think it looks rather nice with the gray stucco. The roof is big enough to provide a generous amount of eaves all around the house. This provides shade and protection for the walls, should help with temperature regulation. I think this paint will provide sufficient protection for the wood. The eaves, of course, don't receive a lot of direct sunlight as they're underneath, and so they shouldn't receive a lot of UV light. And the fascia will be somewhat protected by a good drip edge, as well as a 2-3 to three inch overhang of metal on either end. We also don't get a lot of rain here, just a few months of rain in the summer, and the rest of the time it's pretty dry, so moisture shouldn't be an issue either. With the eaves done and painted, we're finally ready to move on to the deck. We're starting out with just the purlins attached to the metal beams, and the first layer that we're adding to that is a one inch thick foam board. We want the seams of this foam board to be staggered with the seams of the next layer of the roofing, which will be the wafer board, the actual deck, and so we're cutting down the first pieces of foam board that we put on. To keep costs low, we're just using one one inch thick piece of foam board here. You could go a lot thicker, but this one inch board will still provide a crucial function. It will create a thermal barrier between the purlins and the roof beams and the rest of the roof layers and will prevent thermal bridging. So we're putting the foam board on first and we're just attaching it in a few places with roofing nails with the wide washer head to hold it down, keep the wind from blowing it off until we can get the next layer on. We're just putting a few pieces on since it's staggered we have to put about four pieces of foam down and then we can put on our first piece of sheeting. We'll be attaching the OSB next and the screws that we use to hold down the OSB will go down through the foam and into the purlins for a secure connection. We did consider making a much thicker foam layer here, perhaps using two pieces with overlap seams like we did on our house, but that not only costs a lot more in the cost of the foam, but also you have to add another layer of purlins there. With our house we did decking first, then foam, and then another layer of purlins, and so there's a lot of additional cost there. And we felt like for this home it would be sufficient to just have a relatively thin layer of foam board. We'll still get the benefit of a thermal break that will prevent thermal bridging. You can see here we have a pile of slightly disgruntled, kind of slightly damaged foam that we're having to use. Unfortunately, just as happened during our home build, we had a dust devil come through as we were working and, and all the foam caught flight. It threw it way up in the air then traveled for hundreds of yards, landed in the mesquite trees, and we had to go round them all up. Fortunately, it's all still usable, but <laughs> we didn't learn from our mistake last year. We're having to walk carefully here as we put this foam board on. A foot in the wrong place would result in that foot going through the foam board. It's only supported by the purlins here, so we're just having to be real careful as we put this on, and then as we walk around and put those OSB boards in place. We're having to cut the foam board around the edges, but it's working out really nicely not to have to cut the OSB boards. The roof is 20 feet wide, which divides evenly by four, so no cutting on the OSB, just stacking those on. We will have to cut the boards as we come to the end of the roof, but that'll be the only cutting required, which is nice. We're using three inch long screws to attach the decking here. That gives us enough length to go down through the foam layer and all the way through the purlin as well to get a secure connection. We're also pre-drilling and countersinking each hole so that the head of the screw lands flush without putting an excessive amount of force on the decking. We don't want to squish the foam. We're also trying to leave a small gap all the way around the edge of each board to allow for expansion. To cut the foam board, we're using a reciprocating saw with a special foam cutting blade. It's kind of shaped like a carving knife and it works really well, makes it really easy. I'm bringing up some of the last pieces of foam which will go on the end of the roof over on top of the eaves. 
We did consider not putting foam over the eave portion since it's not required there. It's just an empty cavity that doesn't affect the house itself. But we would have had to build up some kind of a step in order to keep the decking at the same level. And we decided in the end that it would be more trouble to do that than it would be just to buy a little bit of extra foam and use foam to keep the roof flat all the way out to the edges of the roof, even though it's kind of wasted being out over the eaves. Getting the material up on the roof was actually pretty easy. This side of the roof isn't real high, so I was able to just rest the board up on the roof edge and then just give it a good shove and push it up on top of the roof. We have almost all the foam down now, and we're just putting in some of the last pieces of OSB. We're having to use a tape measure to find the location of the purlins as we screw these boards down to the roof. The OSB does come with some pre-marked lines for finding the purlins underneath, but they're in the wrong location due to the orientation we're installing it in, so we're having to use a tape measure instead. I barely ordered enough foam. We almost didn't have enough. I'm having to use the scrap pieces in order to cover in this last section. Fortunately, it's over the eaves, so these additional seams won't matter. I also didn't order quite enough OSB. Fortunately, we had a couple of extra pieces of plywood that I'd ordered for something else that we were able to use here instead and save us from having to make a special trip to town. It's interesting to note that even though this roof is very low cost by conventional standards, it will still end up being the most expensive part of this house. While designing it, we were focused on keeping the cost low and still achieving the functionality that we needed. The functional requirements for a roof on this type of house are different than they would be on a conventional home. We can focus less on our value in this roof since the massive amount of thermal mass that we have in this house will pretty much take care of temperature regulation. In this roof we wanted to focus on light reflection by putting on a metal light reflective roof and also providing a good thermal barrier with a modest amount of R value. And here's a view out of our kitchen window. We can just barely see Kyle's house from our place. Kyle and I are up there working on it. We are installing the underlayment. We had waited to start this until we actually had the metal in hand. So it has been delivered and we are ready to go. I didn't want to put this roofing felt on several days in advance because I was worried that it would get ripped and tattered by the high winds that we sometimes have in this area. Now that we have the metal, we're ready to get going. We're using a synthetic felt here instead of the traditional tar paper. We ordered the metal from a local material supply store, Thunder Mountain Metals, and had it cut to a custom length. I ordered it an additional five inches wider than the actual roof so that we'd have enough room for two and a half inches overhang on each end. We went with the 26 gauge R panel profile, which is rated for a low slope roof, so it'll work excellent in this application. It's also a good heavy duty material. And we went with the Galvalum color, which is basically a reflective silver color. We had a hard time deciding between white and the reflective silver Galvalum color. And so we did some testing on our home, which has some of both and tested the temperature of both and we found that the Galvalume was slightly cooler when exposed to direct sunlight, so it was reflecting more of that light away than even the white, which I thought was the best. And so we decided to go with the silver because it reflected the most heat. And it was also the least expensive, which was nice. We didn't get any video of it, but we have already installed a two inch drip edge along the front and back edges. We started by putting on closure strips front and back and then put the first piece in place. It's super nice having these pre-cut to length already. We just put them up and put them in place. As you can see, they're not too difficult to handle for two people. We're able to just lean them up against the roof and pull them up from on top. This roof should be about as easy as it gets. It's nice and flat, low slope, so it's easy to walk and move around on. There's also no roof penetrations, so it should go pretty quickly. We are putting a bead of silicone along the ridge that this piece will overlap with to seal the two pieces together. We're sealing along the edges front and back with a pre-made closure strip. It's a foam strip that's pre-made to fit the contour of the metal and it goes down. We just put it down on the drip edge and it sticks to that and then we set the roofing material down over it. 
Unfortunately, we were having a little bit of trouble with it. We were stretching it a little bit as we put it down and it wasn't lining up right with the metal when we were putting the metal down. So we ended up having to unstick it, kind of squish it back and adjust where those ridges hit. Anyway, it, it took some messing with to get those edges aligned, but as we continued working away across the roof, we realized that we just need to be careful not to stretch that closure strip at all, and then it would line up a lot better. We're attaching these sheets as we go along, so we are screwing them differently along the edges than we are in the middle. So along the edges, we're using long three inch screws that go all the way down through the metal and into the purlin underneath, so we get a good secure attachment. And we're putting those screws in in the valley, two per each valley, one on either side of the ridge. And so there's lots of screws along that edge. In the middle though, we're putting them on four foot spacings and we are putting the screws down through the top of the ridge. So not in the valley, on top of the ridge. And that's just to give us the best chance of avoiding future leaks. And so we're doing top of the ridge in the middle, in the valley, along the edges. We have found that there's lots of differing opinions on the best way to position your screws when you're screwing down a metal roof like this. This is the way that we feel the most comfortable doing, but there's lots of different ways you could do it and lots of very strong opinions on it. And here we are happily working away. We're almost halfway through at the roof at this point, and it's looking like we should be able to get this done in just another hour or two. When all of a sudden, when I was bending over to get some screws, I felt a sharp pain in my back. It was in my lower back and it was pretty painful, so we decided to stop work for the day. I ended up spending the rest of the day resting up and it wasn't getting any better. In fact, I was pretty immobilized for a while and it was looking like it could be, I don't know, maybe several weeks before we could get back to working on this. I decided to look up some exercises that I could do to strengthen my lower back and meanwhile the roof just had to wait. It looked like I might be out of pocket for a little while, so our son-in-law was able to help Kyle get the roof finished. And here they are working together, getting some more panels on. We had high winds predicted in the upcoming weather forecast, and so we decided it was time to get this finished up. Really appreciate the son-in-law helping out. It's funny how quickly and unexpectedly an injury can change your plans for you. The only real warning that I had from my back was when I was putting on my shoes that morning, I felt a twinge of pain in my lower back and didn't think much of it. In retrospect, I can definitely see that that day up on the roof, I wasn't being real careful to bend with my knees. I was definitely bending straight over from the back to screw in all those screws. And I think that's what did it. Uh, fortunately, it did, didn't end up being a serious back injury. It was just a pulled muscle. There wasn't any nerve impingement. Didn't have nerve pain. And I was able to do some exercises and my back made a full recovery within a couple of weeks. But it was scary and definitely brought home uh, how serious an injury can be and how important it is to be careful with body position and to work safely. As you can see in the background here, while they were putting this roof on, Kyle had a contractor come in and put in his septic for him. And we'll give you a brief overview of that at the end of the video. Kyle and our son-in-law worked quickly together. It only took them a couple of hours to get the rest of the sheets up. The last piece of sheeting did have to be cut to width so that it doesn't stick out over the edge and then the final step was putting on the rake trim along the sides. The rake trim is made especially to seal along the side. It's a roughly L-shaped profile with one side that comes down along the side of the house and makes a drip edge. The other side goes up and over and down over the ridge of the last piece of metal to seal along the metal top. While we were working on the roof, Kyle was having the septic system put in. 
It all starts out with them coming out to do a soil test, and Kyle's soil ended up having a lot of caliche and clay, which was great for the construction of his home, it's great for the walls, but it's not great for the septic. It ended up requiring a very large septic to be installed. The soil varies a lot, even on the same property in different locations. Kyle's was a lot different than ours and unfortunately required a lot larger leach field. Ours only required 100 feet of leach line and his required over 200, so over twice the size of ours for a smaller house. And you can get a good look here at the concrete septic tank they're using. This is the divider box. It comes out of the tank and goes into three long trenches that they dug. Kyle decided to use an infiltrator system for his leach field instead of the perforated pipe and gravel that we used in ours. And here's a look at the system from the house connection there. We're seeing the inlet pipe that goes into the concrete tank, and then it goes out of the concrete tank and into the divider box, and then into the three trenches. They haven't put in the infiltrators yet. Sometimes the requirements do seem a little bit out of balance. Look at all this leach field here. It's a massive amount of area, and all that's gonna be dumping into this is one toilet, a kitchen sink, and a dishwasher. Everything else in the house will be going into the gray water system, which will be used to water trees, etc. It's really nice to have this done. The contractors did a great job. It was a huge system and more than we wanted to tackle ourselves. It really feels like the house is coming along nicely. The roof is on and completed. The septic system is in and done and my back is feeling much better and I'm ready to get back to the project. We have a lot more coming up, so be sure to subscribe and join us again next time. Thanks for watching.